Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Is uh, welcome to uh, the first online foreign language forum. Thank you, ELT News, for organizing this amazing event online for the first time. Um, I, I can see lots of people saying hello, people I know, hello to everybody, hello friends, hello ex-trainees, hello ex-students. Um, very happy to see you, not see you actually, but you see me, I don't see you, but I can feel you on, um, on a Sunday afternoon. And thank you for, for being here on uh, this day and time. Um, and I will start with a poll. Um, in fact, I want you to go to, you can see my screen now, I want you to go to menti.com. Uh, this is Mentimeter, a tool I love and use a lot for both my face-to-face -face and my online sessions. You will go here and you will enter the code 210349. Uh, you can open a new tab or you can use your phones to do that. And the first thing I want you to do is write uh, up to three words that come to your mind when you think of the big word grammar. Okay, so we started having the good ones, boring, rot learning, rules. Let's see, one, people, one person already submitted. Let's see what the others will write. We go to menti.com, the code is 210349. And the first question is, write up to three words. It's a little bit of brainstorming of what comes to mind when you think of the word grammar. Uh, you know that in Menti, uh, the, in the word cloud, the more people answer a word, uh, the bigger the word is. So the big word here is clearly rules. Okay. And structure and essential, uh, challenge, accuracy, rote learning, hard, boring is big. Uh, rules and boring are getting bigger and bigger. Okay, torture. Somebody wrote torture. <laughs> okay, hard, difficult. Nobody wrote easy. But some people like it because we like challenges. Um, but look at the big words and look how the word cloud changes. Rules, hard, difficult, boring, structure, necessary. Tenses, of course. Grammar is all about tenses, right? Okay, beautiful. I will post this later. Um, because it's a beautiful word cloud made of, made of a lot of people. Hmm? Okay, so boring is getting bigger, even bigger than rules, I think. Okay, let's move to the next question now. Communication breakdowns usually happen because of mistakes with tenses. Now, vote one, phonology, punctuation, or word order. Okay, we've got lots of people going for word order. Um, nobody goes for punctuation. Mistakes with tenses and phonology are almost the same. Let's see, I would like to have a good sample. But it seems that word order is the big thing here. Uh, your, sec your second most popular answer is mistakes with tenses, phonology, and just one person voted for punctuation, or two now. Two people voted for punctuation. Okay, this is a good sample. And finally, one more question. What do you think is the most difficult aspect of English grammar for students? Now, just write one word. I mean, if it's two words, write two words, but just, you know, like very tenses. I know it's always the first that appears. Every time I ask this question, oh my God, tenses everywhere. It's all about tenses. Translation, tenses, translation, tenses, rules. Conditionals, tenses, tenses, remembering the rules, accuracy, mother tongue, influence, L1 transfer, rules, models, relative clauses, word order, phrasal verbs. Interestingly, phrasal verbs, a lot of people dis disagree on whether phrasal verbs should be a part of grammar or a part of the lexicon of vocabulary. I go with vocabulary, passive, uh, phrasal verbs, rules, irregular verbs, causative, again, irregular verbs, are they grammar or vocabulary? reported speech, interesting answers, because we will see lots of subjunctive comparing with Greek grammar, but tenses seem to be meta-language. <clears throat> okay, causative form. Okay, inversion, models. Okay, so um, 
Now I will start with the actual presentation of teaching grammar without teaching grammar. This is just the beginning of, um, this is normally a workshop uh, that takes about three hours. And in fact, it has a second part, teaching grammar without teaching grammar too, which is 100% hands-on. But now this is a, just a, uh, like a teaser of, of the main things this approach is about. So what we're not going to do today, unlike other webinars, I'm going to tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to play grammar games. And we're not going to personify grammar because I know this is a new trend. People like to talk about Miss Present Perfect who got married with Mr. Past Simple and they gave birth to uh, Future Continues, but um, we're not going to talk about that. And we're not going to talk about grammar books or grammar-based syllabi. Instead, uh, what I want us to do is adopt a holistic approach to language learning and language teaching. I want to raise your awareness on how not to focus on grammar. Uh, we would discuss a little bit how language learning actually works and perhaps also a little bit touch on what language is actually tested because this is the big thing. I mean, when I tell people you don't have to teach grammar, they always say, yes, but what about the test? Um, so, I mean, I usually start this discussion with a metaphor. And I want you to take two seconds to think, what is language like? We don't really have time to share our thoughts and metaphors on what language is like, but take a minute, like, you know, think language is like what? Is it like a tree? Um, is it like an airplane? Is it like a river? What is it like? And because it's afternoon, I'm gonna share with you my metaphor. My metaphor is that language is like pizza. And the reason I'm using this metaphor is because you can have your pizza dough, your tomato sauce, your peppers and your mozzarella cheese and all the ingredients. But unless you put everything together and it melts together, it's not pizza. In exactly the same way, you can have the different skills and systems of the language, grammar, vocabulary, phonology, and, 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 and the four skills. But unless you put everything together, uh, it's not language. So every time we decide to teach one thing only, grammar only, in reality, we're not having this delicious pizza. We're just having the mozzarella cheese which is good, of course, but it's not pizza. So it's not language. Um, so, I mean, if you want to remember one thing from today's webinar is that it, it does not taste like pizza unless you have it as a whole thing in exactly the same way. It's not language teaching if you just break it down to pieces and you teach tiny pieces. Now, this is to say that I want us to adopt this holistic approach to language learning and language teaching, see language as a whole thing. And I will start with a personal confession. I used to be like that. I used to be a grammar freak. I used to be this person who would take the grammar slot in the weekly syllabus because I wanted my teachers to know the rules, to know the tenses, to know the meta language. And then of course I moved to the States for my masters and I, I realized I was the only person in the world who would think like that and who would teach like that. And I changed and now I'm cured. Um, now, these are some preconceptions. I would like you to take a minute to read them. I'm actually going to give you a minute. And in the chat, I want you to write numbers of how many of these you agree with. So you write one, I agree with just one. Six, I agree with all six. Four, I, I agree with just four. You don't have to tell me which ones, just how many you agree with. So take a minute. And I look in the chat to see how many you agree with. Okay, we have everything from one to five. Nobody agrees with all six. Oh, somebody agrees with all six. And we have some people who write zero. But you, I mean, from what I can see, it, the, the most common number is four or five. Mm, so, or six. Okay, okay, that's a good sample. Thank you. Uh, normally, we should disagree with all of them. 
And the point of the teaching grammar without teaching grammar approach is to make you aware of the fact that these practices that I was using as well are not the way to go, at least anymore. Um, so I know that most people think that number two is correct, that we need to cover certain grammatical points, but in fact, compare it with number six. Uh, my best students are not grammar experts. My best students are YouTubers and gamers. And there are people who can use the language and people who, who watch series and listen to songs and, and they know the, the, the true meaning of the language and they might not even know uh, one grammar rule. And I can give you the example of my children who uh, are fully bilingual, but if I ask them the, 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 third, the three conditionals, they will look at me as if I'm an alien because they have no idea about grammar rules, but they have passed all kinds of exams, uh, of, of major international exams with great success, and they know nothing about grammar in the sense of rules and meta language. Now, and I mean, read this, what Krashen said, Stephen Krashen, I mean, nobody, when, when we travel, we don't really care about uh, grammar books. We carry dictionaries with us or phrase books because we want to communicate. How much does grammar help us communicate? Um, so I'm gonna tell you a true story. When I was doing my master's in Vermont, we had a fantastic phonology teacher. And at the end of the lesson, one of my fellow students um, of Greek background as well, went to him and she said, uh, professor, do you want the kiss? And she, she kept asking the same question. And, and professor, I was, I was thinking, what is she talking about? And professor was really perplexed. I mean, do I want the kiss? Don't I want the kiss? Uh, but can you guess what she meant? She meant the keys. She had the keys of the lab. So this is just to say a personal experience to confirm a research finding that communication breakdowns in spoken language happen mainly due to phonology. And in written language, they happen mainly due to spelling, punctuation, and word order in that order. Punctuation got only two votes in the question I asked you at the beginning, and word order was quite high, but it's, it's the, the third most important and tenses remember they got quite a few answers but they really have nothing to do with pronunciation break communication breakdowns and look at phonology phonology can cause huge communication breakdowns but how much do we actually teach it comparing to the time we dedicate to grammar teaching now the questions we need to ask ourselves is is the grammar we teach authentic is the grammar we test authentic? And is the grammar in major exams the grammar we teach? The answers to all three are no. Um, and this is just an example. It comes from a major exam. Um, and this comes from the grammar section. And you can have a very quick look in the questions and you will see that these are not things that can be taught grammatically. These are things that should be taught lexically. So this is what we call lexicalized grammar, which is really um, chunks. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is how language teaching should be done through the teaching of chunks and collocations and frequently used phrases and forget about the rules. So my first point today is that grammar should not be taught through artificial rules. It should be taught through use. Plus the English language for historical and geographical reasons is not very rule governed, as you know. We create rules that we sell to our students and they're kind of fake. And then we tell them when they reach an advanced level, oh, now forget about the rules, they, they, they really, they're not valid. Now, going back to education philosophy, John Dewey, uh, an American philosopher and education visionary, uh, talked about how we learn from, not only from experience, but basically from thinking about our experiences, from reflecting on our experiences. And this is what we call nowadays metacognition. Historically, uh, first people were learning through very practically through experience, learn with formal education, through studying, through reading. And now we know that we learn through metacognition. So we do things and then we think about what we did and we analyze them. And this is how we remember better. And this is very much um, similar to the findings of the brain-based learning framework, which is informed uh, by neuroscience. And these are the principles of the brain-based learning 
learning framework, and this should inform all our decisions of teaching anything. So my favorite principle is that the teacher should be an experienced orchestrator. And the approach of teaching grammar without teaching grammar is precisely that. The teacher organizes experiences for the learners to live. The learners live the language and use the language through these experiences. And then the teacher will decide whether the teacher will reveal the structure behind the experience. Usually it's not necessary. Sometimes it might be. Now, the teacher as an ex experienced orchestrator is what Einstein so many years ago uh, talked about. Provide our students with the conditions in which they can learn. So my, my first point was, let's not teach through artificial rules. My second point is, let's remember that we learn by doing and by thinking what we did. Now, you know, bloodletting, it was a common practice in the 19th century, it was the cure for all diseases. But nowadays we know that it's fatal and nobody wants to, to use it anymore. So my, my point here is going, why do I talk about bloodletting? Because in medicine, things have changed dramatically. Same for engineering, same for biology. But in education, how has our teaching of English changed? It was about rules and tenses and structures and meta language. Is it still the same? I'm afraid that in so many ways, the colors have changed, but the content is the same. And this is a, a screenshot, it's only for Greek speakers, I'm afraid, from, from a teacher who's wondering about a rule and is asking in a teacher's group uh, if the rule stands. And I mean, I have nothing against this teacher, but I feel that everybody who tries to answer this question has missed the point of teaching English because it's not about rules. Now, this is, there was a little bit of the background and let, let's look at some uh, more practical uh, things. Now, these are some grammar points that I would like you to think that you have to teach to an A2 plus class. Um, and very quickly, I want you to decide how you would teach them, what context you would need. But before deciding, I just want you, just on your own, to choose one and in the chat, send me which of the four you would, you would teach to this A2 plus class. Just send me which one you think is easier to teach. Okay, so we've got some people who want to teach the difference between less and few. Let's see, stated verbs. Less and few is very popular. Will versus going to. Okay, uh, you got pranked. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Stop sending me. <laughs> uh, basically, you shouldn't be teaching anything because these are grammar points that are not really rule based for, for different reasons. We can go more in depth about it if you, if you when we do the, the full workshop, but really will versus going to, there's not real different in use um, and they're used interchangeably for, for a long time now. Um, you will not find it in any test, in any exam. Um, and the only real difference that there is is that will is more formal and going to is more informal. So we spend like two weeks of teaching something that is of absolutely no use uh, to our students. Um, and then the state of state verbs, it's, it's a very common discussion among linguists. Why do we have to spend all this time teaching the state, state of verbs? And then our students go to McDonald's and it says, I'm loving it. But it's not just McDonald's. I'm going to give you examples from Cambridge Dictionary. All the first five examples are from Cambridge Dictionary. And the last one is from Penny Err. Uh, and these are all state of verbs that break the rule because we break these rules all the time. The same with less and few. I mean, uh, if you see, if you watch my TED talk or if you read my article for ELT News, you will see that less and few are constantly misused. It's not misused, it's really used in different ways than what we teach our students. Not by, it, not just in conversational English, but in the speeches of Barack Obama. So it's, is it our word against Obama's? Mm, he's the most educated president of the United States in history. So think about it, a very eloquent man. 
Um, Leo Sullivan, one of my favorite applied linguists, uh, talked about stative verbs as a little bit of time wasted. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but it's the same with uh, reported speech and change of tenses, less and few, and many, many other grammar points that we spend time teaching through detailed grammar rules that really mean nothing. So, can we teach grammar? I mean, let's go back to the big question. And I don't know what you think, but I think, yes, we can. Uh, I'm an optimist anyway. So, if we teach the language, we teach grammar. Some of you mentioned when we did the word cloud before that teaching that grammar is important. And I totally agree with you. Grammar carries meaning, but it is important when it's part of the pizza. It's one of the ingredients and we need this ingredient to be of high quality. The moment we isolate it from the other aspects of the language, we cannot teach it that well. Um, these are the basic rules of teaching grammar without teaching grammar. Have a quick look at them. Uh, but I would like you to focus on the rule of economy. Economize on presentation, maximum practice. Do you know, based on research, the maximum time students can uh, spend paying attention um, to grammar presentation? It's, I don't know if you can guess, just guess a number. It's maximum five minutes. When you start presenting grammar, your students zone out. A gray cloud is above their heads. They don't really care. Some, some really try to focus and they can focus for maximum five minutes. So why should we do that? Uh, economize on presentation. If you have to present a rule or a formula or whatever, do it very quickly. It might make you feel good. Oh, I have my PowerPoint and it's so well made. And, you know, I have my rules and I have highlighted the exceptions and everything, but they don't care because this is not how we learn the language. Uh, and how can we teach grammar meaningfully and creatively through different channels? Uh, I'll show you some examples from classroom practices. Uh, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes actually now. Close your eyes. Everybody don't look at me. Just listen to my voice. Close your eyes. And I want you to think of a person you really, really love. Just try to visualize this person. See this person in your mind's eye. Don't tell me who this person is. Just think of this person. And now I want you to think of what this person is doing right now. Is this person sleeping, having lunch? Is this person taking a walk? Is this person having fun with friends? Is this, is this person studying? Just think of this person you really love and think of what this person is doing right now. And now go to the chat and write to me. I thought of whoever, I don't know, I thought of my partner. My partner is sleeping right now. This is a true example from my life. I thought of my partner, my partner is sleeping right now. Do the same, right? Who you thought of and what this person is doing right now in the chat. I thought of my friend, my friend is working right now. <clears throat> he's cooking, my father is eating, he's studying, he's watching friends. This is what I would be doing if I was not at this webinar with you. He's driving, he's watching TV. Well, great, you know what we just did? We did a present continuous exercise and here it is. Uh, so instead of giving you the rules of present continuous, I, instead of writing the form and, and, and the use and all these things, I ask you to think of a person you love, have a positive feeling, and I gave you the use, and you use it. And by the way, this is how I introduce present continuous to the little ones. And it's very, very easy. Uh, this is an exercise from a book. I came across it very recently, and this is an example of teaching grammar without teaching grammar. This teaches present continuous and have a look at how it's done. It's not done through focusing on the form, but focusing on meaning. The students have to look at the picture and understand what is happening. So it's critical thinking, it's vocabulary, it's grammar, uh, it's visual understanding. There's so many, thing involved, so many things involved and you actually care about what is happening. It's not mechanical, it's not rule-based. Uh, so my approach is teach grammar lexically. 
Um, and there, there are many applied linguists who, who believe the same. My professor for my PhD, Lourdes Ortega, um, was telling us in an SLA course that the most common verbs in English, with the exception of one, have irregular past simple. So what should we do with them? Teach them lexically. Teach the past simple as a word, not as the form of the verb, not through the th three columns. But as a word, what it means. Because you know, when students look for the word, they never ask you, oh, hi teacher, how do we say the past simple of go? They ask you, how do we say piga, or in any other language? How do we say, not how do we form? So think about what that means. Uh, my favorite approach to teaching anything is teaching through narratives, through stories. Uh, and I think this is one of the most powerful tools we have to teach language holistically and to teach grammar without teaching grammar. Um, and also through creative writing, um, there are many, many tasks we can share that teach grammar through uh, the writing of poems, for example, or stories. Uh, of course, through CLIL, I'm going to show you uh, an example of an activity I do with my pre-A1. Um, we bring, you know, uh, a tank, we put water in it, and I ask them to bring objects from home. Some of them sink, some of them float. And the question is, does it sink or does it float? And they have to answer. So the focus is not on the question or the answer. It sinks, it floats, or it doesn't sink, it doesn't float. The focus is on predicting what is happening. Uh, but actually, what, we do, what I do through this activity is teach present simple uh, interrog affirmative, interrogative, negative. And it works really well and they never forget about it. Uh, we can teach grammar through arts and crafts, through fairy tales. We don't have time to go through this experiment, but I just want to say that if you decide to teach grammar through fairy tales, make sure it's a fairy tale they already know in terms of contents so that you can take away the workload. Okay, so we don't want them to try to understand too much uh, if we want to focus on, 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 on grammatical structures. I have an example here, but we don't have time to do it. Um, through role plays, uh, it's, it's a great tool to teach grammar and you can have them memorize the role play and then this stays with them. Uh, through project-based learning, one of my favorite approaches as well, uh, which always ends in a presentation. Uh, through songs, by focusing on meaning and not on form. And through stories. And I'm going to end this presentation by telling you a story. It will only take one minute. And what I want you to do is while I'm asking questions, I want you to write down the answers in exactly the way I'm asking you to. So this story is called The Man in the Chest, and it's a true story. So once upon a time, there was a man who lived in a faraway country, and he had a very regular, normal, routinary life. He would wake up in the morning, go to work, have lunch, watch TV, read a book, go to bed, same day, same routine, day after day. One day, our man, remember it's a true story, got a notice from the post office. Uh, the sender was anonymous and he went there and he was given a chest, a wooden chest, this size. And... There was a problem though. Okay, the sender was anonymous, but also the chest was locked. So now I want you to write down, what would you do if you received the box, the wooden box, the, the chest? I want you to write down your answer like that. If I receive the box, I would. Write what you would do, okay. So our man, I mean, I'm assuming some of you would open it, others would not know what to do. Maybe someone would take it to the police, maybe someone would throw it away. But our man, our man took it home and he didn't know what to do with it. So he, he was kind of scared. Um, and then a day went by, a week went by, a month went by, a whole year went by. And on the exact same date, he gets a second notice from the post office. Now, this time he went to the post office and he was kind of anxious and he saw, he got a second box, a very small one this time and wooden as well. And in this box was the key. Now, I want you to write, how would you feel? What would you do if you got the key? 
if I got the key, I would. Okay. Our man, uh, and it's a true story, I repeat, uh, got the key, went home, thought of opening the box, but he didn't. It's been 15 years and the man has not opened the box yet. It's a true story. Now, the next question I ask my students is to think what is inside the box and why wouldn't the man open it? And this is my way to teach, to introduce the second conditional, which some of you mentioned as a difficult grammar point. Um, so this is just a very, very brief demonstration on how we can teach grammar without teaching grammar. Grammar quizzes are okay, uh, but they need to have a context. They, you, we cannot just give isolated um, items. And just as a final point, when is it okay to teach in grammar explicitly? It is okay if we're dealing with B2 and above learners or adult learners, or we have a specialized course or in cases of fossilization. So remember that we should be viewing the teacher and we should be teaching as experienced orchestrators and not, not as rule providers. Uh, and that we can learn grammar without being taught grammar. Most importantly, let's not teach language, let's not teach grammar without teaching the language. What we are is language educators, not grammar teachers. Let's have the whole pizza. Thank you very much. My email, if you need anything, um, I'll be happy to answer to questions, uh, but this is the end of, of the webinar for today. Thank you.